Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to look at the ability of the human mind to adapt to the challenges of contemporary times. With me in the studio is Dr. Robert Ornstein, the president of the Institute for the Study of Human Knowledge. Dr. Ornstein is a lecturer at Stanford University and at the University of California at San Francisco. He's the author or co-author of 19 books, including on the experience of time, the psychology of consciousness, the psychology of meditation, the evolution of human consciousness, multi-mind, and new world, new mind, co-authored with Paul Ehrlich. Welcome, Bob. Glad to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you. Your background is in uh, the neurosciences. Physiological psychology, it was mostly the study of how the mind relates to the to brain structures and how the mind comes out of the workings of the brain that's what i did most of my early work in mm -hmm. and you've looked at the evolution of the human mind and and i think one of the key insights that i get from reading your work is that the, the evolution of our brain-mind system was completed 40,000 years ago, long before the, the rise of human civilization. Most people don't realize that the human mind evolved to suit conditions that are very, very different from those we face today. When the human mind reached its current state biologically, human beings were living in scattered tribes of 200 people who never saw another tribe whose life would never, ever change. Life today, as you can imagine, is almost entirely different. Yeah. Well, I suppose it's a credit to our adaptability that we've been able to create societies that are so very, very different from these early cultures. Well, human beings are the most amazingly adaptable creature on Earth, where, if you think about it, our life is so different from that of any animal that lived 40,000 years ago. In 40,000 years, we've created television, we've created, we've created airplanes, we've created metal, we've created societies. We've changed our population so much that humanity is really an entirely different animal than it was before. And there's no other animal that's ever done anything like it, even remotely. Mm -hmm. I think one of the interesting uh, things here is that the kinds of, uh, well, well, let me step back and say this, it took us, what, what millions, billions of, of years, I suppose, to evolve from, from a, a primitive organism, that the, the way we are has been fixed over a very long, long time in a very, very different world than the one in which we live now. It took really um, <clears throat> 999 thousandths of Earth's history uh, before the first human being ever appeared. Uh, and that was the first precursor of humanity. It took another um, five million years before our first real ancestor appeared. So if you took the whole history of the Earth as one year, all that happened in recorded history would take place in the last minute before midnight on December 31st. Mm -hmm. That should give you an idea of how much we owe to all the organisms who came before us, how many of our reactions are not social, not gender related, not culturally related, not dependent on things that have to do with issues of our time, but things that have to do with the way the human nervous system developed on the nervous systems of lots of other animals who lived long before anybody ever thought of humanity. Yeah. And the way our mind-brain system has developed seemed to be rather uh, well adapted for culture and society up until maybe a hundred or two hundred years ago. The it's it's hard to know when the split occurred. Mm -hmm. Remember that for most biological organisms 
change is only really possible, biological change is possible in hundreds of generations. Perhaps, let's say a thousand is what people who work with the fruit fly look at for producing significant change. We are a hundred generations away from Christ. During that time, more people now are added to the earth each month than lived at the time of Christ. And these are people who live with microchips, who live with computers, who live with airplanes, who live with rocket travel, who live with guns. When we existed only a hundred generations ago, which is no time biologically, our world was so different that it's almost incalculable. Mm -hmm. And having been, I suppose, conditioned for life in a primitive culture, our, our nervous systems are adapted to respond to immediate threats to our well-being. That's one of our major problems. We're very good at responding to the news. I mean, the news is focused on disaster in Croatia, air crash somewhere else, etc. We're not very good at looking at the slow, continuous changes that actually threaten our society. Let's consider just a couple of things. Yes. Everybody remembers uh, the Pan Am 103 air crash several years ago, almost five years ago now in Lockerbie, Scotland. Yes. 270 people were killed. And it's a it was a terrible thing. But during the time it took the trucks to get to Lockerbie, more people were killed in the United States by handgun murders than were killed at Lockerbie. About 290 people were killed. And more people are killed each week in handgun murders, double that amount, than were killed at Lockerbie. Yet we don't notice it because it goes on over and over again. We're very good at noticing changes to a current state. We're not at all good at mm -hmm. noticing uh, what's going on. We're not good at noticing the slow rise of AIDS cases. We're not good at noticing the kind of behaviors that leads lots of young people to get AIDS until first Rock Hudson and then Magic Johnson got AIDS. When those things happened, you see the old mind springing to action. Aha, this is something I can notice, like the story several years ago of the little girl falling down a hole, which really meant nothing. Our minds are geared towards these changes, and that's because for most of life on Earth, let's say 99.99999 plus percent, no organism could really do anything about the changes in the world. We either biologically adapted or died. Mm -hmm. um, so all we could really do is notice immense threats to our current state, a thunderclap, a tiger, a lion approaching, and all we could really do is run and get the hell out of there. It reminds me a, a little bit of uh, the nervous system of a frog that's been studied, where a frog is very good at seeing a fly if it crosses that's the right. visual field, right. but not much else. Well, a frog will actually, I could show you a movie if I had it, a frog will actually starve to death if he's surrounded by dead flies. Now, he could eat every one of them, but he is unable to see, or it, to mm -hmm. be non-sexist, is unable to see dead flies because the frog's nervous system is only evolved to strike out at flies in what would be its average natural environment, and obviously they'd be flying. And in a similar way, our nervous system is, is built this way, seems to be what you're saying. Our nervous system is built to respond to what you might call, what have you done for me lately? We're, we're short-term, short-horizon animals. Uh, a president may achieve great success, but what have you done for me lately? A marriage may be in good shape, but what have you done for me lately? Society may be going in a terrific direction, but it's what have you done for me lately? We're not very good at looking at slow, long-term changes, and yet those, smog, pollution, uh, the overcrowding of the earth, are really beginning to threaten us. And in that lies some of the most fundamental difficulties that we face in our current world, which is basically, in some science fiction terms, we're strangers in a strange land. Our nervous system evolved to, to succeed in a short-term world, and now we're in a different era. Yeah. One of the other things that you point out I find quite striking is that we invest huge sums of money in, in certain endeavors where there's a very small payoff and neglect to put uh, funds 
government funds, for example, in areas where the payoff might be very considerable. We spend lots of money, partly because we've always spent it. We spend lots of money on um, weapon systems, which we have for a long time on weapon systems designed to defend us against what turn out to be non-existent threats. We don't spend small amounts of money on training people to become well educated enough so that they're good enough engineers to uh, know what the world is about or even at a lower level just compete with the Japanese. We've spent fortunes chasing after nothing. In this it's the same problem. We can only look at things in our own small time frame. In this we're like a homeowner who will go out and spend $250,000 on a house and then doesn't Blanche at spending another 25000 for refacing the floors, but at the same time will say, I can't afford 15 bucks to go to the movies. Mm -hmm. It's because our expenses are also calculated against in a relative rather than absolute way. And we're basically blind to the world as it exists. Yeah. Another example you point out is the enormous amount of money we spend fighting various diseases, developing miracle cures, and a relatively small amount of money on lifestyle issues that might contribute much more to our health. The leading cause of the leading causes of premature death could all be addressed not at any extra medical expense, but at a savings in medical expenses, simply by teaching people to learn how to manage their own health. And yet the amount of money that we spend for that is almost nothing. We do the same thing in lots of other areas. Crack, because it's, it's interesting, it's exciting, it's different, it's picturesque, uh, gets an enormous amount of attention. But suppose I told you about a drug that was six times as addictive as crack. Um, and that will kill more people next week in the U.S. than crack has ever killed and will kill four million Americans in the 90s. You would think we ought to spend a lot of money on it, but it's just cigarettes. And cigarettes are yet another part of the mind's background, the kind of stuff like the frog looking at a bunch of dead flies in front of him, we just don't see. Mm -hmm. We don't see what's in front of us because our nervous system is designed to cancel out what's in front of us and just show me the news. Mm -hmm. But social commentators have been pointing out the absurdities of, of modern culture for a good 30 years since the since the 60s. I think well, forever, what, really. Mm -hmm. What's unique about what you're saying is, is that we have to look at our own nervous system if we're going to get a handle on this at all. Well, in this, we're like people looking at the world through a funhouse mirror. You know, if you look at a funhouse mirror, you see some things get distorted, some things uh, get almost, uh, almost disappear. What we don't realize is that our minds are like the funhouse mirror. Oh. Our minds are the mirror that brings certain events high up into consciousness, which is why terrorism is such a good value, basically, for the terrorist. Why, by simply trying to kidnap one person, maybe a young girl, maybe a pregnant woman, you can change the course of history. It's because we're designed to notice things on a very, very small scale. So the first thing I'm trying to do in, in some of my work is to make it clear to people that we have to retrain ourselves to basically know what this funhouse mirror of the mind is so that we can begin to discount the kinds of events that occur in our lives. It's not that easy because billions of years of evolution have prepared us to live a different life than the life we're going to lead. But the very possibility that we can develop what you call a new mind simply by understanding ourselves in this way, that sounds like a radical concept. It's like some kind of a break with normal evolution. Well, we have to make a break with normal evolution deliberately and consciously simply because human society has made a very big break with normal evolution. Normal evolution has given us a brain, as we said earlier, that's designed or, or evolved rather to suit a world that we have completely paved over. We've paved over, we've flown over it, we've covered it with smog, we've filled it with people. Um, during my lifetime, for instance, I was born in 1942, it took from the very first human being who was ever born to my birthday to produce 2.65 billion people. It took my lifetime to add 2.65 billion people. 
we have changed the world more during the time I've been alive, I believe, than humanity changed the world since day one, whenever mm -hmm. you count day one. So we've got to do something different. And it's not only that we have to do something different, we have to make people understand that our history is encoded in our biology, not just the history that goes up to ancient Egypt. The ancient Egypt, uh, while it's very interesting, has less to do with what's gone on in the mind than, say, your example of the frog, or things that we could talk about, about the way the aplesia nervous system works, or the way other nervous system works, nervous systems work. We have to realize that the new humanities have to be the human sciences, that people need to understand what they're really like, how they think and how they often make such obvious mistakes in judgment that could be, over, could be overcome if we understood that this is just the way we are. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what you're saying is that we can actually change perhaps even the structure of our nervous system through self-awareness. Um, I think through self-awareness and especially through education in youth. Now, it's not as radical as it seems. It's just more deliberate. If you or I were born in the Philippines, we would speak Tagalog or another language, and we would speak it as well, or in some cases, like mine, as badly as we speak English. We would know how to do it. We wouldn't think about what we were saying in it. We'd be able to do it. We would know all sorts of other things if we lived in a rural environment, what the shape of trees signifies to how the river is going to go, etc., which is totally um, amazing to a kind of urban westerner like myself. But you could have, we could have switched places. Someone else could have had my background and done what mm -hmm. I do. I could have done what they did. So the point I, I think that, that needs to be made is that the human animal is, unlike any other animal, the most amazingly adaptable creature and can learn to deal with all sorts of different worlds. And it won't be very difficult to do my feeling is only that we simply have to decide to do it. Yeah, that's interesting because, well, for example, the population explosion that, that you've described, it gives me a feeling of helplessness. What can we do to get this under control? It's amazing to even think that something is possible. Well, if we don't, I think it, the situation is totally helpless. And I think, again, there's no way that even I could make everything better in one magic uh, sweep of my hand. Mm -hmm. No one can really do it. Yeah. Uh, all we can really do is try to make a small difference around us. All we can do is try to communicate to other people what the world we're living in is really like and start to make individual changes that eventually will snowball. It may be a local school board, it may be writing something different, it may be trying to more clearly understand why it is we make the same mm -hmm. kind of mistakes we do. Well, I, I gather in uh, the work that we've been talking about, what you're attempting to do is to point out to people that we notice the dramatic changes, we don't notice the subtle changes, and yet it's these subtle changes that are uh, threaten us much That's right. more. It, it's, the, it's the adding of more people next month than lived at the time of Christ, and the month after, and the month after. It's the 400,000 people next month who are going to die from cigarette smoking and the month after and the month after. Not the one spectacular flame-out car accident or air crash, which is going to be on the evening news. What people in the media need to think about is to use their creativity to make these continuing tragedies clear to people. Mm -hmm. Why is not a person who is dying from the air pollution in, say, where we are in the Bay Area, just as interesting a subject as someone who gets shot in a drive-by shooting? Mm -hmm. uh, why isn't um, a person whose life is severely restricted by the encroaching population uh, problem as interesting as someone who gets kidnapped? It's up to people like us to try to communicate to others that we're misdirecting our attention towards things that are sort of unconsciously stimulating. Mm -hmm. If people thought about 
what could consciously change the way we deal with the world, we could still do just as many interesting trash television programs, interesting and exciting news programs, books, etc. But we might actually, if we pull together on this, begin to make a difference on some of the big problems. It's interesting that you're using the term consciousness, and, and in a sense we're juxtaposing it with millions of years of evolution. And what you seem to be saying is that consciousness has the force to, to counteract that uh, something as innate and, and physical as our own nervous system. Well, um, just as the kind of early environment that you and I have, starting even in the womb, will affect the way we think, our early training affects the way we think. So in adulthood, the way we consciously decide to act and deal with the world can affect the way the world works. The problem, I think, has been that while a lot of people, especially some people who've read some of my work, have been very interested in consciousness, they haven't tried to apply consciousness to anything that will make a really big difference in the world. What this current um, line of work that I'm on is to try to bridge the gap between people who are interested in consciousness or interested in their own minds and also who see that the world, as you said, seems to be going into just such a horrible state that I couldn't do anything about it. So one thing to do is to retreat into self-indulgence or into self-consciousness. My view is that we can't afford to do that, that humanity at this point is facing problems that we have never seen before and it calls for a greater leap in our understanding than we've ever seen before and that leap goes under the name I think of increasing consciousness. Yeah. Well, do you feel that it's sufficient to, to discuss it intellectually or are there other approaches that we need to work with? I don't think it's sufficient at all to discuss it intellectually but that's all I'm really equipped to do and there's so much to discuss intellectually that I could do it um, 48 hours a day for the rest of my life. Um, I think people need to get started changing the way they tell their children about what's going on in the world, who they identify with. We've got to begin to change the way our religious ethics are organized. We, we can't just say is this good for the Catholics and how about those horrible Protestants or is this good for the Jews or is this good uh, for um, the Muslims? Kind of a tribal mentality. That's right. It, mm -hmm. Well, a lot, of the, a lot of what we see going on these days in the world is an attempt to come back to this small tribal world. A lot of the, the sense of trying to re-articulate ancient rites or ancient rebels or, re, or try to connect up with ancient religions is an attempt to get back to a world that we're comfortable in. The problem is that world is in fact long gone. Yeah. There's no room anymore for 10 million tribes of 2,000 people. It's just not going to work. You have written about uh, your involvement with the Sufi tradition mm -hmm. yourself and, and you suggest that it does offer some I don't even know how to describe it it seems like something intangible but something that's needed well I think a lot of a lot of the wisdom that, that Huxley called the perennial philosophy that people have called consciousness raising is in fact the kind of thinking that we need to deal with as we face the future and I think you can find it in say the work of Idris Shah in the Sufi area. You can find it in lots of places, but I found that to be among the most exciting. Mm -hmm. You've even done some research that, that indicates that, for example, the Sufi stories that Idris Shah tells, which come from the Middle East uh, Islamic tradition, uh -huh. have an effect on, on the uh, right part of the human brain. Right, right. Uh, what we did in that mm -hmm. experiment was to record from the two halves of the brain while a person was reading sort of ordinary descriptive text and when a person was reading one of Shaw's stories and we found that Shaw's stories basically changed the way the brain was working. Mm -hmm. They were changing the way the nervous system was actually responding to the story. Um, well that's a transient measure 
I think it's quite true that these kinds of ideas uh, do change the way you think. Um, they do change the way you look at yourself, they change the way you organize your thinking, and they change it in a way that may help us face our future. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that in, in this research you mentioned that the changes occur in the right half of the brain. As, right. as I recall, and I should point out for the benefit of our viewers that you're probably the, the prime mover behind the popularization of the concept of the lateralization of, of the brain in your book, The Psychology of Consciousness, nearly All 20 years many ago. years ago, right. Yeah. And it, but what you're saying is that if we don't understand that our brain has different components, if we think of our consciousness as unified, we're missing something so fundamental that we can't really begin to understand ourselves. Well, if we think that we have one mind that can make rational decisions based on what's presented to us, then we will continually go down the same disastrous road that our civilization has gone down in the 20th century. And it's no accident that we've gone down it along with this continuous emphasis on sort of rational thought because that development was the development that made our civilization great, as it were. Yeah. I mean, that's what gave us the steam engine. That's what gave us the rocket ship. That's what gave us the whole, the whole deal that we're trying to confront at the moment. That's what gave us the modern rise in population by increasing the, the rate at which infants survived uh, mm -hmm. early, early uh, life. So in a sense, we're, we're coming around full circle and having to deal with uh, our own creations. Well, the problem is that we, like Pogo said, we've met the enemy and it's us. Yeah. We're the ones who have made this world and we are the ones who are going to have to change it first by changing ourselves. Robert Ornstein, I can't think of a better note to end on, frankly. Uh, you seem to have come right to the heart of the issue there and with your focus on the evolution of our nervous system are giving us some very powerful tools to look at how we can change ourselves. Thanks. Thank you so much for being with me and thank you for being with us. Thank you.